Hello and welcome to Wandering Wanda. I'm Marielle. We are at the Madison Pittsburgh KOA in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia? No, Pennsylvania. Don't even know what state I'm in, let alone the city. Anyway, this whole RV site is on a hill. So the site is fairly I wouldn't say it's level, but I did have to put two blocks down. The site is supposed to be 50 feet, but it's barely 50 feet. So, almost hanging out. Almost. We're at site 57. booked a premium site but they called me back to tell me they don't have premium sites here <laughs> they did give me a refund regarding it so no premium sites at this KOA they're all just regular pull-through sites there is another Airstream <laughs> They seem to put airstreams together. I don't know why, they just do. Again, site 57. We're here for one week, Sunday to Sunday. 50 amps, water, sewer. They have a really nice laundry room. I think I'm going to do my comforter here. They have an industrial size dryer. <sighs> okay, we're gonna unstow the Starlink and hopefully we have signal. I don't see any obstruction, so I'm sure we will. We are here in this rainy day at the Allegheny Portage Railroad National Historic Site. It is in Gallatin, Pennsylvania. The first railroad constructed over the Allegheny Mountains was considered a technological wonder in its day. The inclined plane railroad operated between 1834 in 1854 and played a crucial role in opening the interior of the United States to trade and settlement. Okay, my book's getting wet. They are supposed to be open. Today is Labor Day weekend. They open at 9, so we'll go get our stamp and go. I don't know if I'm going to walk around or not. We are here at the Flight 93 National Memorial at Somerset, Pennsylvania. On September 11, 2001, the passengers and crew of Flight 93 
courageously gave their lives while thwarting the planned attack of our nation's capital. Since the memorial's dedication on September 11, 2011, thousands have visited to pay their respect to those brave individuals. This is the day that the world changed. I do remember what we were doing. We had just moved in the night before to the Irvine house. Walker's dad calls us on our cell phones to tell us that they have grounded all the flights. And remarkably enough in this trip, we were at Gander up in Newfoundland to where all the planes landed internationally. Now I'm here at this war memorial. I'm getting all choked up here. The airports before this day, you could just, there was no TSA, you could just go right into the gate. And after this day, everything changed. The world changed. Not for the better, unfortunately. I do remember what we were doing very good friend of mine Sandy calls me up and tells me that she didn't want to be alone and I said you know what why don't you come over and I'm unpacking the kitchen and you're great at organizational skills so we spent the day together commiserating on how the world changed that day Park guide here with our National Park Service, everyone. This National Memorial is one of more than 400 units of the National Park Service across our country. Many of them are our country's natural resources, places like the Everglades or the Grand Canyon. Others, like Flight 93 National Memorial, is made important by an event that happened here. Here, of course, nearly 21 years ago, Flight 93 crashed in that field just on the other side of the walkway over there. Everyone, after those terroristic, well, first off, to let you know what you're in for, I'll talk for about 29 minutes today, everyone. And you might say, what, can we just round that up to 30? Well, I picked that number 29 because it's an important number in the story of Flight 93. 29 minutes is the amount of time that passed from when Flight 93 was first hijacked until the, te until the passengers and crew members started their effort to take back control of the plane. So that short period of time that we'll spend together, or which you might sort of uh, waste watching a situation comedy or something on television, that short period of time, those 40 strangers to each other, they gathered information, they assessed what it meant, they made a decision, they did some planning, 
And then they took bold and decisive action. And they changed the course of history. Everybody, there's certainly room if those of you want to come a little forward so that everybody can sort of sneak in the back and we'll all stay dry and we'll, we'll be okay. Um, now everyone, after those terrorist attacks on September 11th, our nation created the 9-11 Commission. Now its job was to thoroughly investigate what had happened that day, to create a historical record and to make recommendations so that hopefully such a terrible thing would never happen again. It's a big, thick book. I hope uh, it's certainly an excellent source to learn about September 11th. And there's one sentence in there that I carry with me every day when I come here to work. And I hope you'll take it away with all of you when you, when you leave here today. The 9-11 Commission said, This nation owes a debt of gratitude to the passengers and crew members of Flight 93. Their actions saved perhaps hundreds of lives and most likely preserved the U.S. Capitol from destruction. That's a very nice, clear statement of why our nation has decided to build this national memorial right alongside that crash site out there. Now, one of the key features of our memorial, it's out there in the background, folks, down there a quarter mile away, the white marble you see down there. That's what's called the Wall of Names. It is Danby marble brought to us from Vermont. It's the same marble our nation has used on the Jefferson Memorial and which we continue to use on the gravestones at Arlington National Cemetery. Using that here is a clear signal of just how important the 40 passengers and crew members are. Now, when you get down there, I hope you do, I see we've got a fair number of umbrellas. Um, it's a very impressive sight. You'll find 40 marble panels, each one has the name of a passenger or crew member inscribed in the stone. And when you stand in front of those, it might be easy to think of the 40 as being perhaps, as being larger than life, as being almost superheroes. Now certainly what they did has become a modern legend. But remember everyone, that when they boarded Flight 93 on the morning of September 11th, 2001, at Newark International Airport, those 40 people, they were regular people like all of us. 33 passengers traveling for various reasons, some on vacation, others on business, others just trying to get back home, and then seven crew members doing their jobs. Now, 46 minutes after takeoff, those 40 people found themselves plunged into a nightmarish situation, confronted by four murderous terrorists who wanted to hijack that plane and crash it into one of our country's great buildings. And those 40 people, they, they stopped those terrorists. They faced very long odds that day. Those terrorists had been making those plans for two years. Everyone, we all know now, of course, that the terrorist attacks on September 11th were carried out by an international group called Al-Qaeda, led then by a terrorist named Osama bin Laden. Well, five years before September 11th, another terrorist named Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he went to, a, that, that man, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is now in United States custody awaiting a military trial. Well, in 1996, he went to bin Laden with the idea of deliberately crashing hijacked planes into buildings. Now, at the time, bin Laden liked that idea, but he thought it was too complicated for his group to carry out. So he put it on the shelf for later use. And that later use, everybody, I'm going to pause a minute and ask, let's all come forward a little bit. Folks in the back, if you come under, you won't need your umbrellas. We'll have more room for people. Usually we have plenty of room, but we're all trying to stay dry. I'm just going to stay where I don't go out there. Okay, thanks everyone. Now, that later use came in 1999. It was just after bin Laden had issued a call for terrorists around the world at high temperatures for long periods of time. Al-Qaeda knew that they would need to have their own people to 
guide those planes to their targets. They knew that no commercial airline pilot would fly their plane into a building, no matter how much you threatened them. So they needed people from their own ranks. One of them was a, a man of Middle Eastern descent who'd spent some time living in the United States and had taken flight training. The other three were also men of Middle Eastern descent from various countries who'd been living in Hamburg, Germany. They were there taking college courses, engineering type stuff. Al-Qaeda thought that those men could learn how to fly planes fairly easily and also very important, they each could speak English fairly well, so they would blend into our society when they came here. Those four terrorists entered this country a year before September 11th, and once here, they began taking flight training at various private schools, both using simulators and getting up in the cockpit of small planes. The other terrorists that day were what, what we call muscle hijackers. There were 15 of them. Now, when I say muscle, it's a little deceiving. They weren't necessarily all big, strong, hulking men. They were mostly under six feet tall and fairly lean in build. But they practiced what they were going to do that day. They were ready to kill, and they hoped to die on September 11. Their job was to break into the cockpits of the planes to kill or disable the flight crew put a trained terrorist at the controls, and then put everyone else at the back of the plane and keep them under control until the plane could reach its target. They also entered the United States in those final months before September 11th. Al-Qaeda did a lot of research and planning for these attacks. They looked at our security systems to see what you could get on board an airplane. They found, for example, you could bring small knives, less than four inches long, on board planes back then. And in those final months, about 21 years ago, right now, three of those terrorists who would guide the planes on September 11th, they took surveillance flights. They bought tickets on the same routes they were going to hijack. And when they did, they carefully observed everything from the security screening until when they sat in first class, they looked to see whether the cockpit door was locked as it should be, whether flight attendants were going in and out of that cockpit door. They decided that their best plan was to break into the cockpits as quickly as they could after takeoff. And also everyone, Tuesday, September 11th, a Tuesday morning was not picked randomly. There were at least a couple of good reasons. One is that back then, aboard those kind of cross-country flights they planned to hijack, there were far fewer passengers on a Tuesday. If you read about each of those hijacked planes, you'll see that all of them had much fewer passengers than they could carry. That's simply the way it was back then in the airline industry. Al-Qaeda knew that, and they wanted that. They wanted to have less people to keep under control. They had an idea that if people found out what was happening, they might fight back. And secondly, perhaps most important, Tuesday, September 11th, was also the day when our Congress, the Senate and the House, were returning from their summer vacations. They were both going to meet in the Capitol that morning the building we think is the most likely target of Flight 93. And so everyone, after two years of extensive detailed planning, 19 Al-Qaeda terrorists successfully boarded the four planes they planned to hijack on the morning of September 11th. They selected four planes that were going to leave on a very tight timetable all within 25 minutes of each other. One at 7.45, two at 8 o'clock, and the last at 8.10. The reason for that was that they wanted to hijack those planes and carry out those attacks one after another in rapid succession so that it would all be done and over with before we could realize what was happening and before we could do anything about it. 
And as we look back, everyone, we know that that tragically, that plan worked all too well. Two hijacked planes struck the towers of the World Trade Center. Within 90 minutes of their being struck, the, both of those towers collapsed. A third hijacked plane struck the Pentagon. Everyone on the plane was killed, as were 125 people inside the Pentagon. In all, nearly 3,000 people were killed on that morning. When you see that list of names on that last panel up in our visitor center, those are all names that people killed that day. Only one plane didn't reach its target that morning. Flight 93, rather than continuing on a mere 18 minutes flying time to its target in Washington, D.C., instead crashed out there in that field. There's a boulder out there. We can't quite see it from here. There's a boulder out there. We put it there to mark the spot where Flight 93 crashed. It crashed there rather than continue to its target because of the 40 people whose names you'll read down on that wall. Circumstances that morning gave those 40 people a chance to change history. They seized that opportunity and they made the most of it. They stopped those Al-Qaeda hijackers. The circumstances that gave them a chance involved timing. Flight 93 was 25 minutes late taking off. Now, it wasn't because of weather, everyone. Many of us will remember that September 11th here in this part of the country was a clear blue sky. So it wasn't, it wasn't bad weather like we have today that caused the delay. Instead, it was simply air traffic. There are three big airports right in the New York area, just a lot of planes trying to get in the sky at the same time of morning. So Flight 93 was delayed. Now people who flew out of Newark back then, they knew that. I often will ask a group about that, and people who flew out of Newark, they always were delayed. They knew that, but fortunately for our country, the Al-Qaeda terrorists didn't take that into account. That threw off their planning. Flight 93 took off 25 minutes late. By the time it took off, had you been standing on that runway at Newark Airport, you could have looked across the Hudson River and four minutes later seen the first plane strike the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Flight 93 then headed to its destination of San Francisco. It headed west. And as it was traveling there across Pennsylvania, those attacks against our country began to unfold. And the response by our military, by the FAA, and by the airlines, it was confused and hesitant. The terrorists had taken us by surprise. Critically, everyone, there was no easy way for the airlines to warn all those pilots in the planes about what was happening. They didn't know what was going on. It was a very time-consuming process, almost like sending a text message to different people one at a time. So that work had to be done by different airline employees. One of them, a man named Ed Ballinger, he was a dispatcher for United Airlines. He was responsible for about 16 planes that day. So he started sending those messages. One of them got to flight 93 at 9.22 in the morning. And it said, beware of any cockpit intrusion. Two planes have struck the World Trade Center. But in the cockpit, Captain Jason M. Dahl, the pilot of Flight 93, he was confused. It didn't make any sense. Because unlike all of us on the ground with a TV or a radio, those pilots didn't know what was going on. So he wrote back, Ed, please confirm latest message. But before Captain Dahl could get that confirmation, the terrorists broke into the cockpit at 926. Now when they did, they were, they were late doing that. I mentioned that they planned to get into the cockpit as quickly as they could. On the other flights, they did that within 15 or 30 minutes. But aboard Flight 93, for whatever reason, they waited 46 minutes. 
So that was an extra 15 minutes at a time when every moment was precious. But they did break in at 926, and the sound of the struggle could be heard by other pilots and air traffic controllers because it went out over the radio. They heard Mayday, Mayday, followed soon thereafter by get out of here, get out of here. And that, that was the sound of the terrorists breaking in and killing or incapacitating Captain Dahl and First Officer Leroy Homer, the co-pilot. When they did that, they put a terrorist at the controls of Flight 93. And that terrorist turned Flight 93 from its westward heading, and he turned it back to the southeast, back toward us here, and toward its target in Washington, D.C. But by then, everyone, it was 928. It was getting late. By then, the first tower of the World Trade Center had been burning for 40 minutes and the second for 25 minutes. Now we all on the ground, we knew that, and very soon the people on Flight 93, they were going to find that out as well, and that knowledge would lead them to make a bold decision. Now folks, I'm gonna pause in that story for just a moment. Excuse me, my friend. <laughs> this memorial is of 40 passengers and crew members. When we give these talks, each of us likes to introduce you to a few of those people to show you their photos, tell you something about them. Everyone, this, this is Sandy Wa, Sandra Wa Bradshaw. Sandy was a flight attendant on Flight 93. She was 38 years old and she'd been doing this work for 11 years. She loved being a flight attendant, but in 2001, Sandy flew only a couple times a month. She had young children at home that she wanted to spend more time with. Now, very soon after the plane was hijacked, Sandy did what other flight attendants on other hijacked planes did that morning. She called the airline's person on the ground and spent several minutes calmly describing what was going on. And that was very helpful to investigators afterwards. It was a testament to her courage and her professionalism. This is William Joseph Cashman. Mr. Cashman... Mr. Cashman was 60 years old he grew up in the New York area, and he still lived there. He served in the 101st Airborne, and he was a member of the local Iron Workers 46 for more than 40 years. He actually did some work on the World Trade Center, so you can imagine how angry he might have been to learn that his own handiwork had been attacked. Billy Cashman, he was traveling that day with his good buddy, Patrick Joseph Driscoll. Mr. Driscoll was 70 years old, the son of Irish immigrants. Patrick Joseph Driscoll served in the U.S. Navy, and afterward he got married and uh, raised a family of four children. Those two good friends, they were traveling together. They were going to meet a third friend in San Francisco and head out to Yosemite National Park. They were going to do some hiking in those nice late summer days. And then finally, everyone, Honor Elizabeth Wainio. This young woman was a passenger on Flight 93, 27 years old. Uh, she was returning home after a friend's wedding uh, over in Europe. Now, she grew up in Towson, not far from here, down in Baltimore. Was a big fan of the Baltimore Orioles. And that morning, everybody, she, she talked to her stepmother on the phone. If you read about that call, you'll find out that Lizzie, as her family knew her, she was more worried about how all of this would affect her family than she was for her own safety on that terrible day. And so their, their names and the names of all 40 are down there, the people that we honor here at this memorial.
Now everyone, I mentioned the passengers and crew members, they found out what was going on and they did that by making phone calls. They weren't using cell phones for the most part because the plane was too high in the air most of the time. They used instead something known as an air phone. You can see examples of it in our visitor center. Air phones used to be uh, mounted on the middle seat of the row of seats right in front of you. You could take your credit card, pick up the air phone, and call somebody on the ground. And back then it was surely a tremendous novelty. You'd call somebody, hey, it's me, guess what? I'm flying across the country. <coughs> but on September 11th, those air phones, they were making, they carried life and death messages. There were 37 calls from 13 different people on Flight 93. Now, some of those calls were just disconnected. Three of them were voicemails that you can hear up in our visitor center. Most important though, in at least five calls, people aboard the plane learned from talking to people on the ground that hijacked planes were being deliberately flown into Belgium. And they quickly realized that if they simply hoped for the best and stayed in their seats, that that would likely happen to their hijacked plane as well. So they started to talk to each other to talk about doing something. They took a vote, probably just a show of hands, but they voted and they decided that because, as everything else had failed, that rather than allow their hijacked plane to become an instrument of murder and destruction, that they, as passenger Thomas Burnett Jr. told his wife, we're getting ready to do something. So they started making plans. And at 9.57, 29 minutes after the hijacking, they started their effort to take back control of Flight 93. And when they did, they all put down their phones, they ended the calls that they were on. One of those calls was made by Sandy Bradshaw, the flight attendant I introduced you to. Sandy was on the phone with her husband, who was a commercial airline. Clearly shown in this memorial. It's shown above at the visitor center by the walkway, the walkway that leads from the parking lot to the visitor center. It then goes directly in front of the wall of names, through the wooden gate, out to where the boulder has been placed in the field. Flight 93 came in over that path at a 40 degree angle, nearly upside down at 563 miles an hour. And it crashed out there in that field where the boulder is at 10.03 a.m. on September 11, 2001. Everyone aboard the plane was killed. Tragically, the passengers and crew members never got back to their families. Instead, for 21 years, their families and all of us come here to honor those 40 people. Plane 93 crashed there instead of going on to Washington because of the 40 passengers and crew members. Everyone, we can, I think we can safely say that had they not done what they did, that most likely nothing else would have stopped Flight 93 from reaching its target. Those of us old enough on that terrible day, we all have terrible images burned into our minds. It's hard to see that video again at the visitor center with images of smoke rising from the Pentagon or of the towers collapsing. Perhaps worst of all, that second plane striking the South Tower. As much as we try, we'll never rid ourselves of those images. We'll have them the rest of our lives. Everyone, I suggest to all of you that were it not for the 40 passengers and crew members, we each would have yet one more terrible image burned into our minds. It would be that of Flight 93 slamming into the United States Capitol killing perhaps several hundred more people and destroying the symbol and the center of our democracy. It didn't happen because of those people. 
Our nation has built this memorial here alongside that site right out there, that crash site. When Flight 93 crashed out there, what had been a common field surface mine for coal became a field of honor forever. It is one of the most important sites in our country with the memorial here, future generations of Americans and people around the world can come here, look on that important ground, and learn again, or learn perhaps for the first time, or remember the important story of Flight 93. People come from around the world to do that. I thank all of you folks for coming out today on this uh, wet, dreary day and giving me a chance to share that. at Friendship Hill National Historic Site in Point Marion, Pennsylvania. This is the country estate of Albert Gallatin, Secretary of the Treasury during the Jefferson and Madison administrations. He purchased the Louisiana Purchase. He purchased the Louisiana Territory and funded the Lewis and Clark Exp Expedition. Gallatin's interest in American Indian culture led him to create the American Ethnomological I've never heard of that word. I gotta look that up. Ethnological Society. I still don't know what that word is. Okay, I gotta look that up. Okay. We'll go exp We'll go explore friendship. Yeah. Today we are at Fort Necessity National Battlefield in Farmington, Pennsylvania. On July 3rd, 1754, colonial troops commanded by 22-year-old Colonel Colonial George Washington were defeated in this small stockade. This opening battle of the French and Indian War began a seven-year struggle between Great Britain and France for control of North America. Hmm. This is before our independence. All right, we'll go take a look at Fort Necessity. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that this park requires you to wear a mask. Everyone's been vaccinated, and those that don't, shouldn't have to be forced to vaccinate and we should not be forced to wear a mask.
this has been a very emotional national park. A lot of people in the visitor area center. I've never seen so many people in tears at the national park. I'm still tearing up. We'll leave it at this. Thank you for watching. Bye.